Now, um, if you have a floor that's way too big, first thing you're probably going to want to do in layout is press the D key and turn down your grid size. I'm going to turn that down to 5 meters. So that way my camera's not too uber large or too far away. In fact, speaking of camera, I'm going to go ahead and before I even do any animation, I'm going to move that camera in a little bit tighter to the floor. And also, when I'm working here, I'm going to go to my backdrop and I'm going to make my backdrop so that it's uh, it's white. How come? Because I, I, you know, I'm thinking I want everything kind of light. And if you look at it, quick look through VPR, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, the floor still has a little bit of grayness going on to it. I don't want the floor to be completely, but by turning up the luminosity, what that did is that kind of uh, lightened up my shadow. It's not a completely black shadow. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back to uh, this texture, uh, shaded solid, and I'm going to change the light. I'm going to hit the P key, and I'm going to go with uh, some point lights. Uh, again... This is going to speed up my render time. But if you want something to look really, really cool, you know, tossing in an area light, uh, much better. But I'm going to go ahead and actually toss in two lights. Go ahead and throw in another light. And that's going to be another point. Call this light number two. And remember when you add in that second light, by default it's going to be at a lower intensity. So I'm going to press the P key, crank that intensity back up to 100% to where... The other light is, well, it never was back up to 100%, but I'm just cranking it to 100%. And I'm just going to place those two lights. Now, I'm going to move the camera in just a little bit tighter, but I also got to remember that uh, that before I get too far, this is going to be something in motion. So I'm going to make some changes to the camera. I'm going to go to resolution. I'm going to go with high def, duh, and uh, change my samples. Now, I'm going to turn on motion blur because I'm going to have some motion happening here. So I'm going to go with photo real motion blur and I'm going to do two passes so it looks cool I don't really want to see the dithering so at least two and like all good things since I'm using motion blur I'm going to go with a seven on the maximum number of samples now you'll find that you have a lot of geometry here if you're playing with the blocks and so you might see that uh, that maximum number of samples might not get rid of all your jaggies so just be aware that, uh, that you got to balance that whole render time with what you want something looking like. So the application of bullet dynamics is actually the easy piece. Um, first things first, I'm probably going to set this ball in motion. So I'm going to go to my objects and get destructo. And uh, I don't want it really on the ground unless I want to go to na 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 I don't really want the shark ball happening. So we'll kind of start it off camera and somewhere about frame 50 have it go through the object and there we go and have it end off camera and when i say off camera small little gray lines that's the x uh, the extension of my high def pictures so then it's just a process of somewhere around here starting with well your bullet dynamics i'm going to go ahead and since the ball's already selected that's going to be a kinematic body body in motion I'm going to go ahead and select the tower. That's going to be my parts body. It'll go ahead and it'll decompose those. And actually, it'll do a, a dynamic for, yeah, I know, it's kind of looking like it's going through the ground. Because the ground's not a ground yet. So I'm going to grab the, select the floor, and that's going to be my static body. Okay, a couple of changes that I'm going to want to see, though, before I get too far, is that uh, you should always go into your item properties. All right, item properties. And uh, make some settings. So on my kinematic ball I want to have just a little bit of a collision margin uh, 0.01 and that is something in Lightwave that's kind of always a piece that uh, seems to help and they even mention that in the addendum the Lightwave 11 addendum underneath the uh, bullet stuff and uh, I'm going to go into the same thing here at a 0.01 10 millimeter collision for my blocks a couple other things I'm going to do with the blocks though I'm going to make them a little more dense and I'm going to turn down the friction, and uh, not by much, but I'm definitely going to get rid of any bounce. I don't want any bounce happening. I'm just going to turn that bounce to zero. And I also want the, the blocks to stick together just a little bit more. So I'm going to go to the glue strength, and I'm thinking so about frame 40. looks like it's sort of still together. Uh, I'm going to turn that glue strength up just a little bit, 30% maybe, so that it kind of holds the shape just a little bit longer. And there we go. That actually looks a lot better. And that is uh, that those changes that I made there strictly 
to taste and uh, what you do and what you're trying to create can be completely different uh, with the floor I'm gonna take the bounce down to 10% I want a little bit of bounce but not much I could adjust the friction if I wanted to as for the uh, kinematic one again same thing here if I want to play around with any of those gonna be completely to taste um, you know bounciness I probably will turn that down actually I'm gonna turn that off completely um, going to go ahead and press zero. Now you'll notice that every time you make a change down at the bottom of the screen, uh, Lightwave is recalculating the bullet dynamics. And that's just kind of how it works. In fact, one of the things that it says in the Lightwave manual is that it tells you that when you get your settings uh, to move your playback head to the end and it will calculate all of the simulation frames for you. Um, I found that when I do that, uh, my computer crashes. <laughs> yeah. I know, one of those things. So let's give it a test run. I'm going to go ahead and hit the play tool. And I uh, got a little bit of, actually, I got two little bit of a problems. Uh, first of all, my ball misses the object. Holy smacks, I didn't even check the top view or the right view. And uh, yeah, there's the top view. Oh, yeah, there's my line. Nice job. There we go. I'm supposed to be teaching a lesson, and I don't even completely get it right. So this is actually a good case where if you want to make a change, the suggestion is that you turn off the dynamics button, and then that way it doesn't do any calculations until you actually make that change. And so then you can enable the dynamics, and you'll see you'll see the change. So, um, but your your window that I'm looking through here, uh, it still started to crash before the ball even gets there. See, the get ball gets there right about frame 16. And uh, so what can I do? Well, I don't want anything to happen until frame 16. So I'm going to just tell Lightwave to not calculate any bullet dynamics until it gets to frame 16 when the ball makes that first smack. In fact, I'm going to tell it to, at 15, I'm going to put a keyframe on the planks. Now, if I put a keyframe on the planks by just pressing Create Key, and frame 15 say okay I can go back into the item properties for the planks which is right there and I could tell it to activate to not activate until it has the last keyframe and so by making that keyframe what I'm doing is I'm telling Lightwave to for it to to hold its shape it's kinda of cheating a little bit but it depends upon you know how you put the model together and the, and the weight of the model and how the boxes or pieces are sitting together and so uh, realistically remember that this is not a perfect simulation but it's a pretty good simulation so I cheat just a little bit by telling it to hold its shape until the ball smacks it and then when the ball smacks it I get more of a realistic smack and the wall kind of just falls on down and right there so is that the only way to control when something starts crashing? The answer is no. Uh, one other option that you have inside, if you go to your item properties and you look at your planks, you also have an option under activation to start sleeping. Uh, sleeping means that it's not going to do anything until something hits it, very much like setting the keyframe. When would you use this in different from setting the keyframe? Well, this time you don't have to set the keyframe, but it may be something that if you want to control when something starts falling apart, um, setting the keyframe could give you more control. Start sleeping is just going to be something that won't happen until, well, you actually get a crash. Uh, here's an example. I got this one on start sleeping, and this is a slightly different view. Um, I have an object that's rolling this time. And uh, the ball is just going to kind of roll across the screen and going to come on down there. At this point, then what you're really going to do is maybe set a nice little camera motion, and uh, and if you if you don't like the speed that it's happening, because this it's it's fairly fast, I could slow things down. Um, how can you slow things down? Well, there's two ways. You have inside bullet dynamics. If I go under world properties, you have a something called time scale. And what you could do is you can turn the time scale down. So right now I only got 120 frames. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to 240. So it's eight seconds. And that's in the ending frames. And if I were to set it to 240, um, I'll find that somewhere around the 80 frame mark, um, all the blocks hit the ground. Okay. Now, I can, if I would have went back to world properties and changed my time scale to 50%, that means it will do the calculations at 50% the speed, kind of like nice slow motion. Very much you get into the matrix bullet time kind of thing. And so my ball moving a lot more in slow motion, and you'll find that the slow motion 
that is then knocking over, finds that at frame 80, I'm, my planks are still in, in, uh, in mid-flight. And so they don't really get to there until 160. Well, because I set my time to be at 50%. Now, one other way to do that is that you can also go in and instead of playing with this time scale, you could leave it at 100%. And I could have gone into Lightwave's options, and that's pressing the O key in Lightwave, and I could have said don't render at 30 frames a second, but render at like 150 frames per second. And if I render at 150 frames per second, it will just simply render out in the space of what normally would be one second, 150 frames. I might take those 150 frames and I put them into a video editing program, and that's going to give me five seconds worth of playback. And so I, if I just set, and right now what I did is I set Lightwave's frames per second to be 150. And if you set Lightwave's frames per second to be 150, you get a slightly different kind of look than you would if you played with the world properties. Again, that's something that's going to be completely up to taste. And if I do this uh, too slow, well, I find that uh, that you can actually see some of the motion falling, but it's not falling because Destructo hit it. It's falling because, well, I don't know. I didn't build it right. Maybe I should have enveloped the glue. Yeah, that would have been it. Envelope the glue. A lot better control. Yeah. The process now just becomes going through and, and doing a render, and that's pretty much going to conclude uh, this little lesson.